This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Again, thank you for joining us for the first of our Healthy You Heart webinars for February. Uh, today's presenter is Joanne Loughton. Joanne is a nurse with 38 years of prof professional experience and a wide range of clinical, teaching, and leadership positions. Her career mosaic spans many diverse clinical settings in both acute and community healthcare settings, such as emergency departments, case management, and home care. Joanne is currently Mather Hospital's Director of Nursing Quality, Interim Director of Infection Prevention, and the Stroke Coordinator at Mather Hospital. Joanne? Welcome, thank you. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to um, present this uh, great topic during uh, Go Red for Women in Heart Healthy Month. So this topic is on, on women's health. Today's talk is why women need to know about heart disease, what heart disease is. Uh, we're gonna look at some of the risk factors that um, are part of heart disease, how to talk to your doctor, when to talk to him, um, when to take some actions and getting on the road to heart health. So the truth is that um, heart disease is still the number one killer of, among, of American women, no matter what their race or ethnicity. Uh, that's changed a little bit this year due to COVID, but believe it or not, um, heart disease plays a huge role in COVID. It's one of the comorbidities that we have to look at. Uh, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes. So it's it now more than ever is the time to control our heart disease uh, because it would play a huge role in the COVID pandemic. So heart disease kills one in every three American women. Um, heart disease can permanently damage your heart and your life. You know, um, um, any incidences of heart disease will um, take over your lifestyle for permanent damage. It'll decrease your ability to do um, have a, uh, a good quality of life. So next slide, please. So more women die from heart disease than any other forms of cancer combined. More women die of um, uh, of uh, heart disease than breast cancer. So 39,520 women from breast cancer versus coronary artery disease. Every minute a woman dies from heart disease. On an average, there are 460,000 women a year die from heart disease. Of that, 64% of these women die suddenly from coronary artery disease with no previous symptoms. Um, you know, um, we tend to procrastinate as women. We tend not to, to look at these symptoms. We always think it's something else. You can change the slide. So a little bit more facts. Uh, women are roughly 10 years older than men when they present with, with heart disease. Um, young women have a worse prognosis than men. So the younger that you are and the more heart disease, the more episodes of heart disease that you have, you are likely to have a worse outcome than a man. Women are more likely to wait and seek medical attention, and I spoke to that a few seconds ago, that we tend to procrastinate. We tend not to go to the emergency room. We, we put it off. Um, women are referred less often for appropriate testing and treatment than men um, because we're looked at as uh, not, not having the symptoms seriously. So I'll give you an example of this particular weekend. I had a good colleague of mine um, she texted me before coming to work and said, I think I'm going to start my day in the emergency room, which is not unlikely of this particular colleague of mine. Um, and then she goes on to say, oh, by the way, I was up for most of the night last night with chest pain, so I'm going to head to the emergency room. You know, just very matter-of-factly when you, it was really needed to be taken very seriously. When she did come in, her symptoms were very serious and she wound up needing a cardiac cath. So just how we procrastinate things. So what is heart disease? So the heart doesn't get enough of nutrient or rich blood. That's what happens when the heart there is heart disease. So if you look at it as um, almost like a traffic jam on the way to work, um, the heart is your, your, your hub to get to work. And if all of the arteries are getting clogged around it, 
there's not enough blood getting to that heart. So it would be like a traffic jam trying to get to the heart. And if this continues, it becomes chronic. Um, it develops over the years. You know, it builds up and builds up and builds up. Atherosclerosis, um, the, arden, the arteries tend to harden with cholesterol, fat, and other substances that fill up the artery walls. And what happens is that as this becomes um, thicker, it becomes harder, almost like cement. Um, and this blockage usually can result in a heart attack because there is not enough of blood going to the heart. So when we look at this little diagram here, the myth is that fat deposits caused by old age. It starts from age two. So when you look, it starts to fill up. This is from our first decade. It starts to fill up, fill up, fill up. By the third decade and the fourth decade of life, we actually have um, you know, narrowing of these arteries and, and blood vessels. So the more that we feed our children uh, fatty foods, you know, we, we stop at McDonald's as it's a, it's a fast meal for dinner, um, chicken nuggets, it's a great meal. All of our kids love chicken nuggets. But what are we doing to them at an early age? You know, when we're giving them, we think peanut butter and jelly is such a great lunch. It's economic, they love it, but there's a, there's a large amount of fat in that peanut butter. So we need to look at alternatives. Um, you know, even when you look at cream cheese, there's a lot of fat in cream cheese. We need to start to look at the low fat things. We, one of the reasons that pediatricians say that we should come away from whole milk from our children after like uh, 15, 16 months is because of all the fat and whole milk and switch to fat-free milk or uh, 1% because we're not doing our children any justice by helping add these fat deposits at an early age. You can change to the next slide. So risk factors. So risk factors are ages 40 to 60. Um, estrogen, as women have, these levels drop during menopause. And when this level drops, it causes us to have a bigger risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Um, no shocker here, smoking. We all know that smoking is one of the major risk factors for heart disease and stroke. High blood pressure. We need to keep some of these things under control. High blood cholesterol. You know, the higher that our cholesterol is, the, the, the more chance and the more risk factors that we have. Obesity and overweight. And we all know what happens with COVID. We all have the COVID-20 that we put on. You know, we, um, some of us have used the, uh, the, the pandemic to get more into exercise, to being out in nature more and walking and getting out and, and, and looking at our neighborhood. And that, that's a great thing to do. You know, it's one of the, uh, one of the things I encourage is, uh, yes, we couldn't go to the gym, but we could walk the neighborhood. We've, caught, we've, we've familiarized ourselves with some good local trails, some good walking trails, but it gives us the, it gives us the, um, the activity that we need to help lower our, uh, our obesity. Diabetes um, plays a huge role in, in, hyper, in um, heart disease and family history of early heart disease. Women under the, over the age of 55, that's um, if you've had a family member with that. So some more risk factors that, are, are, um, are, that we should need to look at. Diabetes, it doubles your risk for a fatal heart attack or coronary artery disease. So when we start to look at the risk factors and how they fit in, just the fact that you're a diabetic doubles your risk. Smoking, it's associated with 50% of all coronary events in women. So just the fact that you smoke increases your events by 50%, let alone what it does to your lungs and cancer and everything else. But just for coronary artery disease, it increases you by 50%. So when we look at, can you just go back one second? So when we also look at this, um, the risks that are elevated become even more than minimal use. So just one cigarette, two cigarettes a day, that's not minimal use. It's gonna raise your risk factor even more by that. You can change it now, thank you. So the warning signs, and we all look at chest discomfort, but we have to look at what this chest discomfort is. It's usually in the center of the chest. It should last more than a few minutes or it goes away and comes back. My colleague, um, when I spoke to her, she said, yeah, the, the chest discomfort went on for hours. And we all said to her, why did you wait till the morning? Well, I thought it was going to go away. It went away for a few minutes and then it came back and then it went away and it came back. So these are some classic signs that um, are signs of a heart attack. 
it feels like your uncomfortable pressure, almost like you're squeezing your chest or you feel full, almost like um, when you've eaten a meal, you know, that Thanksgiving dinner that you've eaten and you should have pushed that plate away and you didn't and you feel that fullness and tightness in your chest. Those are classic symptoms of, uh, of a heart attack, that fullness or just out and out pain. The discomfort in other areas of the upper body um, can also be included, including pain or discomfort in one of more of your arms. Women tend to have pain in both arms, not just one arm. And then uh, their pain usually radiates to the back, the neck, the jaw, and the stomach. And this has to do with how we are anatomically. It has to do with the, um, where our breasts are located and whether we're large-breasted or small-breasted. So those are some of the um, discomforts that are different from a woman than a man. You can change the slide. So some of the other warning signs, shortness of breath with or without chest discomfort and other symptom, symptoms such as uh, are breaking out a cold sweat. You know, uh, sometimes we think we're having these hot flashes. They may not be a hot flash. This cold sweat um, accompanied by a hot flash can be a sign of uh, coronary artery disease or of heart disease. And nausea and lightheadedness. Women tend to be nauseous much more than men, and we tend to have more lightheadedness and dizziness. You can change it. So when we look at this, we I, and I thought these were some good um, um, car, uh, pictures. So it feels like you have a ton on your chest. Um, some of these signs are also this, these are stabbing pains. You know, like someone just shot you with an arrow in, in, in your, your neck, your back, your, your, your chest. Um, you're short of breath. Uh, when you look at these cold sweats and you, you just have no energy, you feel like you're running on empty every day. Um, the dizziness, you know, sometimes we turn our head and we think that it's an inner ear. Um, and we also tend to have um, some, some, some nauseousness or upset stomachs. So this was just, I thought was a good little, um, how we can portray this. Next time. So this is a great proverb that I saw. It's a wise proverb. Misfortunes always come in by a door that has been left open for them. So when we leave this door open and we see these symptoms and we do nothing with them, we're letting that misfortune come in because we have not closed that door. We have not looked at these um, signs and symptoms and done something with them. We've let them fester. So we've opened the door to say, come on in and we'll try to manage these without going to the doctor. Next slide. So what is your risk? Um, one risk factor doubles your risk. So we talked about this. One risk factor of smoking doubles your risk of heart disease. Two risk factors. Well, if you smoke and you have high cholesterol, you've now quadrupled your risk. Um, three or more risk factors. So if you're obese and you smoke and you have diabetes or high cholesterol, you've now increased your risk tenfold. So those are some of the risk factors that you can manage. You can, you can stop that smoking and uh, eliminate that risk factor. You can put yourself on a good diet or, um, or a, a low cholesterol diet and try to lower your risk factor. Put in some good exercise, go for a walk 30 minutes a day. I, I know here at Mather, you know, today's a snow day, so there's no walking outside, but we have a walking trail inside the building. So when we have things mapped off so that we know if we go around this loop five times, we've, we've now done a mile go around this loop 20 times. And sometimes the loop is boring, but if you pick a colleague to do it with you and you put your headphones on and you put your earbuds in, it kind of makes the walk go and it gives us um, just some exercise, just getting away from your desk. If you're, if you're working from home now, as many of us are, just getting up and, you know, and walking the perimeter of your house and not just to the refrigerator. Um, take a lunch hour every day, even though you work from home, it's important to take that lunch hour and get up and get away from your computer and, and, and move. Even if you walked your backyard, you need to get out and move. Um, by doing just these four things, eating right, being physically active, not smoking, and keeping a healthy weight, you can lower your risk of heart disease by 82%. That's just about as much as uh, the percentage that we have of, of being, uh, you know, uh, with the vaccines for COVID, if you get your vaccine. 
So just look at this. And, and as I said earlier, the fact that you have would have heart disease or high blood pressure, that's another risk factor with COVID of not doing well with it. You can change the slide. So lowering your risk of heart disease, we talked about this a few seconds ago, maintain that healthy weight. You know, um, when we look at our BMI, you'd be surprised to find out when you're beyond BMI, how, um, how you are on the obesity scale. You know, anything over 25, you're, you're, you start to go into obesity and then you have morbid obesity. You want to you want to manage your calories so that we're not in that range of obesity or morbid obesity. Stop smoking. I can't stress this enough. Just by stopping smoking, you have decreased your risk factor by almost 40 percent. Managing diabetes, you know, um, I live with a diabetic who is uh, the most non-compliant person that I've, I've met in I don't know how long. Um, you know, uh, when you manage a good diabetic diet, there is room for the sweets. There is room for, you know, a, a low fat ice cream. There is room for a piece of candy now and then. But the, the key is um, you, you have to um, manage those, those risk factors um, quickly and um, maintain them. I'm sorry, my screen changed if I went blank there for a second. Um, you know, you wanna manage that diabetes. You need to manage your, watch your, your, your sugars every day, test those blood sugars. If you're scheduled to test it four times a day, you need to do that and manage that. That's also gonna prevent you from having, you know, kidney disease and everything else. And by all means, take your medication as it's prescribed to you. You know, um, I know sometimes we uh, we find now, especially in challenging times with people that are laid off or don't have health insurance, you know, we try to stretch our medications. That's not the thing to do here with heart disease. This is not the time to stretch our medications. Um, there are some good programs out there. Uh, we need to go to the pharmacy and see if it would be cheaper to buy our medication as a generic or um, get some of these good apps to look at how we can get these prescriptions in a cheaper version. But stretching our medication, if it says take twice a day, it means twice a day, not once a day. Or if it says take um, two pills, not taking the two pills, taking the one pills. Taking this as prescribed is the most important thing. You can change the slide. So lowering your risk, you need to begin today, as I talked about, 30 minutes of moderate exercise, intensity activity on most days a week. And you know, I'm not saying that we're gonna start out and we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna run. You need to walk slowly to start with. You need to build yourself up. You know, we all learned, needed to learn how to crawl before we walked. So it's the same thing. If we have not had any exercise in a long period of time, no one expects you to go out and run 30 minutes on a treadmill or walk uh, uh, two miles or three miles uphill. What we expect you to do is to pace those 30 minutes of activity. Maybe you need to do um, five minutes, six times during the day. You know, just, just getting up during those commercial breaks on TV, or like I said, if you're if you're working from home, take that lunch hour, or in between your meetings, in between your team meetings, get up and uh, walk the perimeter of your house. Start slowly, but then build up. So today, if I walk 10 minutes, maybe tomorrow I want to walk 15 minutes at one interval, and maybe by the end of the week I can do 20 minutes. But if I can't, I'm not going to push myself. I'm going to do 20 minutes for maybe two weeks and maybe that third week I'll be able to do the 30 minutes. So it, the intensive activity of the exercise is at your pace. You know, you need to develop uh, a routine and um, a, 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 an activity log. So follow a healthy eating plan. We want to look at uh, foods that are low in saturated fats, trans fats, you know, and cholesterol and moderate and low fat. So we want to start to read those labels. Look at that peanut butter label, you know, um, start to eat more egg whites. Uh, one of the tricks that I, I say to everyone is do one egg and three egg whites. So it doesn't look so white and bland. You have that yolk of that one egg in there and it kind of gives you a nice fluffy omelet and put some good vegetables in there. Um, you know, when you want to do a lunch, um, some spinach with some, um, I, I, I look at this salad, I, I do spinach, I do, I cut up some corn on the cob in there, I do some strawberries in it, some grilled chicken, 
And then um, I do a little bit of feta or a, two a tablespoon of feta or a tablespoon of mozzarella. And then I put my low fat dressing in there. And I do a dressing of olive oil, um, vinegar and herbs and spices. And I put that on my salad and that's my salad for the day. So I have the sweetness of the strawberries. Um, I have the, uh, the low fat of the olive oil. I have a little bit of feta in there, not a lot. I have some grilled chicken, but it's, that's a good lunch. And the, the one thing that we need to do is control our alcoholic beverages. No more than one drink a day. And when I, when I, when I look at this, I say to, uh, we've gotten larger as uh, time has gone on. You know, if you go to Macy's and you look at that wine glass, it's not that little wine glass that we had growing up. It's a big goblet. And if you fill that goblet and you take that goblet and you do half of that goblet, that's sometimes almost a half a bottle of wine. That would be equivalent to four drinks for the day. So we need to look at that on, on how much we fill that goblet and look at what those alcoholic beverages are. Are we doing a wine? Are we doing a red wine? Are we doing a white wine? Are we doing, um, are we doing a vodka? Or are we doing a, a Moscato that has a lot of sugar in also with it? You know, if you're gonna do that alcoholic beverage, maybe you wanna look at something that has a lower uh, caloric intake, uh, more of a vodka. Uh, and have, you know, uh, a vodka and tonic and do a diet tonic rather than that large goblet of wine. So when we look at some cardiac testing and evaluation, these are some of the things that we need to do to see how our cardiac status is. So you want to monitor that blood pressure. Um, get one of those, um, you know, those um, little manual machines and, and look at your blood pressure on a weekly or a monthly basis. Go for an annual uh, cholesterol testing. You know, when you um, do some fasting plasma glucose or some diabetes testing, these are some of the things that when you go to your primary care physician, these are some of the testing that should be done on a yearly basis. You want to, your, your primary care physician should look at your BMI and your waist circumference, not just put you on a scale because you could be, you know, trim and fat, uh, trim and lean, but if your waist circumference is high and your BMI is high, you're, how lean really are you? You want to have an EKG or an electrocardiogram on a yearly basis, and you should have a, a baseline stress test by the age of 50. And this is good so your physician can see uh, where you are on a baseline. You can change that. So we want to we want to look at your, um, I think this is a double slide. Oh, okay. So numbers that you should know. Your blood pressure. This is this, we want to keep your blood pressure 120 over 80. And actually, uh, the American Heart Association is looking to change this to 120 over 70. So 80 is actually a little bit high. It's a little on the cusp. We want to keep that at the 120 over 70. We want to keep our LDL at under 100. You know, and if you've had um, coronary artery disease or whatever, you actually want to keep your cholesterol LDL under 70. Your, your HDL, you want to keep it greater than 50. And your triglycerides, you want to do less than 150. So when you look at non-HDL -cholester non, um, cholesterol, you want that to be lower than 130. And a good BMI is between 18 and, 29, and 24. Anything over 25, you're considered obese. And, and you could, you know, when you look at that, if you look at someone that's um, a BMI of over 25 and you'll it's very surprising to see what that person looks like because that person doesn't look like they're obese. With a waist circumference of less than 35 uh, for females and less than 40 for males. So think about this. If your spouse has a, um, um, a pair of pants that are 40s, that's large. You want to keep them under a 38 waist. You know, when, we, when, we, when you're a diabetic, you want to look at your A1C less than 7. And many primary care physicians like to see an A1C of under 6.5. That's the new range that everyone's going to, less than 6.5. You can change this. Okay. So if you or someone in your family is already diagnosed with heart disease, don't be disheartened. The science has made significant progress. We can, we can monitor risk factors and be more aggressively. So just because you've been diagnosed with heart disease doesn't mean that there is no light at the end of the tunnel. You can change those risk factors. You need to start to modify those risk factors much more aggressively. 
and we talked about eating healthy. You know, m many more fruits and vegetables. Um, there should be a minimum of five a day and, and start maybe go vegan, maybe go, um, you know, more plant based, um, you know, stay away from that beef. Um, look at more chicken, look at more turkey. Um, you know, even though pork, it's, it, it is the other white meat. Start to look at more pork things, but not lean pork, a nice lean pork chop, not the ribs and then smother them in all that great sauce. Um, the same thing with, um, with chicken. You wanna do the, the white meat of the chicken. You know, this is Super Bowl Sunday coming up. Um, wings are dark meat. Wings have a lot of fat in them. So yeah, everybody thinks, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have chicken, so it'll, it'll be great. But what portion of the chicken are you eating? Are you eating the thighs? Are you eating the leg? Are you eating the wings? Because those are all dark meat. Um, walk regularly. As I said, we have a great uh, walking trail here within the hospital. We're not going to walk outside. And, and, and I look at this um, every year, um, Northwell does a challenge, uh, a walking challenge. One year it was walk to Ireland. Uh, last year it was walk the national parks and it's all done virtually. We always know when the challenge starts because you start to see all of our employees walk the outside of the hospital, walk the parking lots, walk the whole perimeter. And then as the walking challenge um, decreases, you see less and less people walking. I almost wish that we could keep it going. You know, um, the more we walk, the better it is. Um, watch our weight. And this is a hard, the hard thing to do during this pandemic. We have nothing to do. We sit home, we watch TV. We've all become couch potatoes. And we've all um, um, regressed to leisure wear. You know, I know myself, um, I go home. The first thing I do is shower. I put on a pair of comfortable clothes. I'm on the couch. We, we, we've regressed to not wearing um, clothes that we normally would wear to the office. So normally if you wore clothes to the office and things started to feel a little tighter to you, you would start to follow that healthy diet right away. We've gotten into some bad habits with this pandemic. So we need to go back into our good habits. Uh, quick sm quit smoking immediately. That is the single most risk factor that I cannot stress enough. Smoking, is so detrimental for our health. Um, even the vapes that everyone's doing or these e-cigarettes, you're still breathing things in. It's, it, there's nothing I can say more than cold turkey. Put the cigarettes down, keep your weight under control. In addition to improving your heart health, these measures are sure to enhance your appearance. You know, um, when we smoke, you have all of those fine lines around your lips. You know, it's not just the aging process of women. Um, it, it, it's sucking on that cigarette, which causes all of those fine lines around our lips. Um, uh, you know, it, it causes our skin to sometimes look more grayish. It causes the more wrinkles in a face and, and nothing, no woman wants to have wrinkles in their face. And um, smoking is attributed to all of that. It tightens your skin. It makes your skin almost look that leathery. Um, that raspy voice that you hear a lot of women have. These are women that are heavy smokers. We need to, to, to stop the smoking. That is the biggest thing that we can do. Adhere to uh, your medicines and listen to your physician. You know, um, we pay a lot for our co-pays when we go to our physicians for their advice when we don't feel well or for our physicals, but we need to listen to them. They are the experts. They know better than we do. You can change the slide. So now what? What are we going to do? So this is the perfect month to do this. Make an appointment with your physician. And I know it's difficult now. A lot of our appointments are virtual. And um, sometimes I think that's a good thing because we're not actually in that office. Um, you know, you're not waiting in the waiting room. You're not in. But a virtual appointment is better than no appointment. And sometimes um, we, might I, we are finding that our patients open up more during a virtual appointment than they do in an in-person appointment. Um, some, sometimes it's even easier to get a virtual appointment and get that yearly evaluation, that EKG, that blood work, monitor that blood pressure check and that cardiac testing if it's necessary. Don't put off that testing. If your physician recommends um, a stress test or an echocardiogram, do not put it off and say, oh, well, it's in the pandemic. I don't want to go into, I don't want to go and have it done. 
all of the offices and all of our hospitals are taking necessary measures um, so that cleaning and sa sanitizing is being done um, more than it's ever been before. So I would not put off any testing. Um, if you're a physician on a virtual visit or if you've got, had the option to go into your physician's office and may recommend an echocardiogram, by all means, make that appointment. Wherever you have that done, we would like you to have it here, um, but wherever you can have it done, do not put that off just because of the pandemic. Uh, we're finding that people are trying to put things more and more off. Please don't. Um, that stress test. You know, um, um, I had one myself recently in, in my primary care physician's office, and the measures that were taken were great. I had to wait out in my car until I was called in. Uh, when I did go in, I was the only one in the office. Um, the staff did clean up um, the treadmill after I got before I got on so I could see how they cleaned it up. They wiped it all down afterwards. I was the only one that had one gown. Uh, they waited till I was done and I left before the next person came in. So these are all measures that we're taking as an organization and as our uh, primary care physicians at Harborview are doing. So I would strongly suggest that if um, that cardiac testing is necessary, that you, you do go ahead with that and not wait. Next slide. So um, this is the end of my presentation. I'm gonna open it up for um, questions and answers. Um, please feel free um, if there are any questions. Sure, and thank you so much, Joanne, for your presentation. If anyone has any questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, and we will read the questions. And if we don't get to all your questions, or if later on you think of a question you should have asked, you could email us at matherhospital at northwell.edu, and we'll pass the questions along to Joanne for her to answer. Okay, let's see. We have some questions here. How bad is salt for you? So salt is um, another enemy. So what happens with salt is it causes you to retain water. When you're retaining water, you're now putting more pressure on your arteries, your capillaries, and, and not allowing uh, the blood to go through quickly. So that low sodium diet is just as important as a low fat diet. Um, and, and when you look at that sodium, it's not allowing um, your, your, the good exchange of um, minerals and things in your vessels back and forth. So salt is probably just as bad as sugar. What about uh, bottled sauces, things that say that sugar and fat-free like barbecue sauce? So when you look at those labels, that's a great question. So um, when you look at that label and it says it's sugar and fat-free, they're going to put something else in there in order for it to taste good. So more than likely, they've put something like salt, um, and they've disguised the salt to say monosodium gluconate. They've disguised the salt in different ways. They've used different names. So not, if something is truly fat-free, sugar-free, and salt-free, it's going to be tasting like cardboard. So um, yes, read your label. But read what's in that. And remember, when they say that it's sugar-free, they may have looked to see what they're sweetening with. Are they sweetening it with monk fruit, which is great? Are they sweetening it with gava, which is good because it's a fruit? Or are they sweetening it with some sort of corn syrup? And that's what you have to look at and watch for. How do you feel about keto diets? They are very popular for weight loss, but very high in fat. Are there any health benefits? So um, I would suggest that you discuss that with your physician, um, but a keto diet is exactly what it says. It's high in fat. Um, so if you have atherosclerosis and you have, you're adding more fat to your diet, this is not going to be something that I would truly recommend, but I would strongly suggest that you speak with your physician and have them come up with a dietary plan that would work for you. Meeting a nutritionist, sometimes the best benefit is to have some blood work and see what other factors, what's your metabolic syndrome, what is your metabolic uh, makeup, and that would tell them what diet would work for you. There are a lot of great diets out there, you know, there, and there are some crazy fad diets out there. You know, there's, uh, I can go on about years ago, everybody had the cabbage soup diet. Yeah, it was great as long as you follow it. But once you stop following it, a diet, you know, you have to look at the first three words of a diet. You're not going to go on a diet to die. You have to have a lifestyle change. This has to be a lifestyle. 
Um, so keto is great for a short period of time, but is it going to work for you long period? And that's what you have to look at. You have to work, look at something that's going to work for you long range. Okay. Joanne, can stress mimic the symptoms of heart disease? Most definitely. Stress can be uh, very dangerous. The things that stress can do to us, you know, uh, stress can um, um, cause an anxiety attack, which very often mimics a heart attack. Uh, the things that stress can do, it can cause you to lose your hair. Uh, it causes you to have sleepless nights. And when you're not resting, you're, you're also increasing, you're not getting that, um, that rest that you need. It's that fatigue. So yes, stress can be things that would mimic um, coronary artery disease. But you need to get that stress under control because it's also doing things to your cardiac, to your cardiac makeup. And there be only one symptom of uh, cardiac problems or must there be two or more? So any symptom is a symptom. So if you're having um, chest pain, that's a symptom in itself. If you're having that, well, if you're having the indigestion with it, you know, uh, the biggest thing is the chest pain and the chest pain with other symptoms with it. Um, nausea in itself may be a symptom of heart disease, but we don't know that. So, um, you know, just the one symptom of nausea, you have to look at what you had the night before to eat. Um, do you have a stomach virus going on? What's else going on in your family? But uh, the biggest thing would be that heart, the, the chest pain. Another uh, viewer writes, I am a truly apple shaped person. I exercise regularly, but can't seem to decrease my BMI to an acceptable range. Any tips? So I, I think your best bet would be to speak to a nutritionist because there may be some blood work that they need to do to see what's really, really causing your, your metabolic makeup. Um, and there are diets out there that a nutritionist would be able to give you for that apple shape or that pear shape. You know, we all want that hourglass figure, but it's, it's not always going to work. And there are specific exercises that would be targeted for that apple shape. Maybe walking for you is not the ideal exercise. Sometimes it may be something simple as a, a recumbent bike. So, What is the medication with the least side effects to treat AFib as a result of mitral valve prolapse if blood pressure is either normal or low? So that's a question actually for your physician. Um, you know, um, all medications have side effects, including plain old Tylenol, plain old Motrin. So um, many, many medications have side effects, but you have to work with your physician to see what the medication is that would have the least side effects for you. Um, uh, you know, um, it, it depends on what, what you know, uh, what a how much AFib you have. Uh, what is it? Is it mitral valve prolapse? Is it is it aortic valve? Um, you know, what is causing your AFib? So many different things, and not treating the AFib um, aggressively could lead to um, a stroke, which could be even more detrimental than a heart attack, more long-term uh, effects to that. So to just single out one particular medication um, is, is really not beneficial. That's something you would discuss with your primary care physician and your cardiologist. If your BP and cholesterol are managed with medication, are you still concerned at risk of having heart disease? So if they're managed with medication and you're keeping your uh, cholesterol low, and remember, it's not just your cholesterol. You have to look at your LDL, your HDL. Those go together with your cholesterol. But if you're managing it and you're putting diet, if you're putting diet and exercise in with it, then you're managing your risk factors. And that's what you have to do is to manage the risk factors. Uh, this might also be a question for a doctor. Can you explain the condition of a leaky valve and if there is anything to do if all other factors are in the normal range? So um, a leaky valve, and that, that's a good, um, and it is something to discuss with your physician. So what happens is we have four valves to the heart. If one of those valves is not closing completely due to um, many, many factors, you would have that now leak into one of the... Um, atriums of the heart. Um, that's what a leaky valve is, and it's not allowing the heart to empty properly, causing the heart to have to work overtime. So it, it would be no different than having, um, you know, um, a tire that's, um, uh, how can I explain this so it's a little bit easier to understand. Um, you don't want that heart to work overtime. 
So the more that that valve leaks, the more that, that uh, the rest of the heart has to work over time. So that would be something also for your physician to um, explain better. There are degrees of leaky valves, um, for lack of a better word. Um, is it mild? Is it moderate? You know, when things become so severe, that's when we need uh, a surgical intervention. But there are medications that control how you're, the leakiness um, and the degree of how you're, you're managing it. How does reflux differ from heart disease? Good question. So reflux is digestive. When you have reflux, and, and very often this can be caused by a hiatal hernia, um, reflux is when you, when you have that acid buildup and you lay down and you, and you have that indigestion. If you are known to have the indigestion, that's really not a risk factor of heart disease. It's a symptom of heart disease. It's a symptom that there may be an issue with your heart. But if you've already been diagnosed with reflux, then you know that that's a digestive issue and not a cardiac issue. Uh, final question here. Oh, wait, we have one more. Sorry. I have a left BBB and high blood pressure. Am I at higher risk for having a stroke? So you have a left bundle branch block. Okay. And what was the last thing? And high blood pressure. And high, so yes, you are at risk more for a stroke. But if you control your blood pressure and you're under medications for that left bundle branch block, which is a um, form of heart disease, you're, you're controlling your risk factors, which should help decrease your risk factor for a stroke. And another viewer writes, how do we measure BMI? So BMI is measured by weight. Um, it's, uh, this is a great question. And to be honest with you, I don't have the exact answer for you right now. But if you send Stu, if you send Stu your email address, we will send you the, um, the measurement of how you measure BMI. It's a calculation. You could also Google BMI and there are a lot yes. of calculators online that are very easy to use. But offhand, right off the top of my head, I can't, I honestly don't remember that. And I don't want to steer you in the incorrect way. And final question, what are the meds taken for a leaky valve? That would be something you would discuss with your physician um, because every person is different on what meds they use. It's also based on other items uh, or other uh, um, disease processes that you might have or other conditions. You know, um, you may not be able to take a blood thinner uh, if you had, a, if you had uh, uh, digestive issues. So that's something that you would, um, you would discuss with your primary physician. Okay, Joanne, thank you very much. That's our final questions. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure. And again, if anyone has any other questions, you could email us and we will pass that along to Joanne. That email again is matherhospital at northwell.edu. Once you exit the webinar, you will see a link to complete a brief survey. We'd appreciate it if you could complete the survey because your feedback is extremely important to us and it helps us plan our future programs. Thank you all for joining today's webinar. If you would like to view other Healthy You webinars we have presented, you could find them on our website at www.matherhospital.org slash healthy you. Thank you.